Hey everyone, thanks for checking out episode one of Friday Night Mike, a new podcast that we're starting up. I'm Ben Spicer, a co-host along with Greenham County football head coach Scott Grissel. Coach reached out to me a couple weeks ago about maybe starting up a podcast, talking a little bit about what it's like in the life of a high school football coach in our area and sort of talking about the Greenham County Musketeers throughout the season. So I thought it would be a really fun idea and we're hoping, uh, Coach, that our first episode can get a lot of listens. Yeah, man, just super excited and uh you know, I'm a big fan of uh, listening to different podcasts and coaching, you know, podcasts. And, uh, you know, just thought, why not bring one to, to our area? And, uh, you know, you were obviously a, a great choice to, to do that with. I know, um, you know, you've done a lot with my town and, and local sports and done a fantastic job. So, um, to me, it was a no-brainer. And um, you know, I just thought it would be something fun to, to talk some football and, uh, you know, kind of give people maybe a look at the uh, – the ins and outs of a high school football season from a coach's perspective and also, you know, some stuff that happens uh, outside of, you know, just what they see on Friday night. So um, just really excited, man. I appreciate you uh, teaming up with me and, uh, you know, a great opportunity. So thank you. Well, Coach, let's jump right in and get things started. Uh, looking at your time at Greenham County, you're now in your fourth season as the head coach, a 7-5 and five record overall in your first season coaching the Musketeers, and then 6-5 and five each of the last two years. I think you've done a really good job of building and, and laying a winning foundation there at Greenham County. But I'm kind of curious, you know, you take the job from Raceland, maybe what was your biggest surprise uh, about the Greenham County job and, and what it sort of entailed? Yeah, um, you know, I think it being my first head coaching job, you know, there was a lot of a lot of surprises. Um, and you know, anytime it's your first your first job or your first you know go around um, in that position, you're going to get blindsided by a lot of different things. And um, so it, it was just a, an overall learning process, you know, from the on the field stuff, the X's and O's, but really the off the field, the administration side of it, yeah. um, dealing with parents, dealing with you know, teachers and administrators and fundraising and booster clubs. So there was, there was a lot really going on that first year. Um, you know, and you're just kind of learning on the fly. I mean, I was fortunate enough at Raceland, uh, to work under coach Maynard and coach Sammons, who were obviously two incredible coaches and are highly respected, uh, you know, in the tri-state area. And they taught me a lot, but really you don't know what you're getting into. <laughs> until you actually take the jump and, and take that first head coaching job. Um, but I think the biggest surprise at Green Up going from, you know, Raceland, a, a very small school where most of the kids live. I think we did the math one time at Raceland, and, and like 80% of our team at Raceland lived within 10 minutes, a 10-minute wow. drive of the high school. Yeah, and then, and then we get to, you know, to Green Up, and I would say – it's just the opposite. So like 80% of my kids probably have a 20 minute or more drive, you know, to the high school. And we got kids that drive 30 to 40 minutes to get to practice. So that's, that's a, you know, a hurdle to overcome itself, but you you just kind of, you know, you learn what works for your kids and what works for their parents and their schedules. And, you know, uh, one, one thing that we switched from the first year was we practiced in the evenings during the summer and we found that we were having some attendance issues. But the next year we switched it to morning practices and kept it the exact same time that school starts. Yeah. School at Greenup starts at 8.05. That's when, like, the, the first bell rings um, to start first period. So we started practice at 8 o'clock. And that kept the parents on that same schedule of getting their kids to, to the school at the same time year-round. And I think that's been a big help. Honestly, I think with that, too, you sort of get a gauge of how serious your team is, you know, making them come in at 8 in the morning during summer practice. I mean, that's got to be pretty tough uh, for a high school kid. I know I I probably wouldn't like that today. I'm definitely not a morning person at all. Yeah, and I'm the same way. Like, you can ask any coach on our staff or any of the the coaches I've previously worked with, I'm absolutely not a morning person. (laughs) But, But what I did find with the morning practices is, it kept me on a routine that I, you know, kind of with my family and, and getting up the same time, just like it was a typical work day where I'm teaching. And also my assistant coaches love it because they're getting there in the mornings. You know, we're knocking out practice. We're done by like 11 o'clock yeah. um, home and, you know, can cut grass or hang out with their kids and all that stuff. So uh, to me, the morning practices are definitely the way to go. Looking at this regular season, you're in week three. Uh, you had an emotional game 
uh, the first week of the season, the game that came down to the wire on the road against Raceland. A short week to prepare for this game the past week as the game against the Rams was played on a Saturday night. So really not much time for you to decompress and, and sort of process things before you had to get right back out there for this past Friday's game against Fleming County. It might not seem like much to some, but did that impact your schedule and for you personally having that weird opening week Saturday game? Yeah, it's always different playing those Saturday games. And um, I, I like them in the sense of, you know, the crowd and the, the environment. It's, you know, it's it's kind of special to be the only game in town and all that type of stuff. But it really throws a wrench into your typical, your routine. Um, you know, like you mentioned, we played Saturday night. Uh, at, and it's an 8 o'clock start. So, you know, it might only be 30 minutes, but it does make a difference in when the game ends and when you get back to the field house and break down the film. And so – you know, you're you're already a day behind starting your next week. Um, and really, Saturday night after the Raceland game, you know, we stay and watch the film as a coaching staff. And you're talking like 1 o'clock in the morning, one thirty, before you really wind everything down for that night and get home. Um, and then, you know, I think I slept, I don't know, like I went to bed probably Saturday after the Raceland game. It was after 3. It was probably like 3.30 a.m. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and then back up early the next morning because, you know, my, my fiancé and daughter do not sleep in. <laughs> so back up at like 8.30 or 9 the next morning and then right back into getting ready for Fleming County. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a quick turnaround. Um, and all, like you said, coming off an emotional game, I mean, that wrestling game is – it's hard on our kids. It's not hard on our kids, I shouldn't say that, but it's – you know, it takes a lot out of you mentally and physically because it's a rival game. Right. And, you know, our, kid, our kids want to win. I mean, that's a that's a game they circle on the schedule every year. And, you know, we haven't had a lot of success against those guys. But, it's you know, it's a heated rivalry on both sides. And, you know, our kids pour their heart out. And then to turn around and, <laughs> and, and you know, Monday, boom, you're right back getting ready for another one. It's a, it's a challenge to, to the kids and the coaches to get ready. Not just another one, you know, we talked about on the radio broadcast a little bit, a long trip to Flemingsburg, of course, uh, that this has blossomed into a nice little rivalry between both schools. I know something like four out of the last six, now five of the last seven games, something like that have been decided by one possession. We always hear the phrase, a trap game in college football, and it felt like this definitely was with the long trip and a really great crowd there at Fleming County. And it looked like, though, early on, you guys were ready to go. You were ready to play. Yeah, that was a big challenge to our kids all week was to start fast. And um, after the Bath County, the grid game against Bath County, we've really been on them to, to start fast. I mean, I feel like we were just going through the motions against Bath County early on. And it was really frustrating because we've worked so hard to get our kids, you know, to, to work on their enthusiasm and their energy. That's one of the big things we talk about is, um, you know, we call it having juice. And we, we talk about juice every day in practice. And for us not to have any juice against Bath County was really disheartening. So just on our kids all week against Fleming to start fast, and they did a great job. I mean, they came out, they were fired up, ready to go. Um, <laughs> they played nothing but, like, rap music the entire pregame. <laughs> which which honestly kind of seems unheard of since you were playing in Fleming County. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had it. And so I don't know. I mean, I guess the kids liked it. We might have to play more. They were fired up. I, I was giving the kids a hard time. I was like, I think they're just playing like Drake's greatest hits or whatever, but uh, they liked it. And then, um, you know, come out and, and get an early touchdown and our defense get a few stops was was big. And, um, you know, then I feel like we kind of took the foot off the gas a little bit, and that's something we got to work on. I don't mean to veer too far away from the subject here, but I got to ask because it's kind of important, at least to me. I honestly think this is very big in the game day experience and just to get your guys fired up. The pregame soundtrack, so essential uh, to have some good songs on the list. I'm just wondering, you know, how do you go along uh, or go about picking those songs? Do you have someone that does it for you? Do you maybe let the seniors do it? Or do you just take over and say, I'm the coach, I'm playing whatever I want to listen to? So my first year um... – I was all about it. Like, I thought that was important that I wanted to, you know, like create create the right type of atmosphere and, and all that stuff. So I picked the songs my first year. Me and uh, – it was actually Coach Armstrong. Me and him went through and picked the songs. And then the last couple of years, uh, we've had the same guy. His name's Steve Tackett. He's also our Booster Club president. And he does all the music and stuff for the games. And he knows what I like and what the kids like. So 
I just let him do it, and he does a great job with it. Um, we've never, you know, been disappointed with his selections or anything like that. And I think he does get some input from the seniors. So I think he has like a group text with them and he'll ask him, you know, what songs. But for the most part, um, we try to mix it up. Like we don't play just rap or rock. We play, like I'm a big Tom Petty fan. So we play. uh, Won't Back Down. Yeah, we play Won't Back Down. That's what we come out to every Friday night. Uh, When we do our, you know, our skill guys come out to start throwing. We always come out to won't back down, and then we always close the game out with won't back down. So that's kind of been a cool, a cool little tradition that started is playing that every Friday night. No doubt, having that song on your playlist has played a big part in you having winning seasons your first three years there at Greenup County. <laughs> Absolutely, man. You can't go wrong with some Tom Petty. Looking back at that game on Friday on the road against Fleming County, I mean, it's always nerve-wracking being involved in those games where you have a big lead and all of a sudden a couple things go wrong and it seems like the other team can really do no wrong. Just what do you tell your players uh, in those situations? You know, it, it's kind of a, a tough situation because, you know, I was sitting there when Fleming was really getting back in the game and, you know, you kind of learn the the mentality of your team and what kind of makes them tick and what don't. And I'm sitting there debating, like, okay, am I just going to call a timeout and absolutely lay into these guys and just, you know, tear you know tear a new one in them? And you know, I thought about it, but I kind of just stayed calm. And, you know, Coach Moore does a fantastic job with our defense. And I knew Fleming was making some plays, but I knew Coach Moore had our defense under control and would make the, you know, the right adjustments to stop those guys. Um, so I just kind of stayed calm and I just kept telling them, look, you know, we're in a battle. We knew it was going to be a tough game. Don't act surprised. I felt like a few times my kids, their eyes were, you know, I could just look in their eyes and they were just, you know, huge. And like, they were, they were shocked that Fleming County was, was coming back. I'm like, God, you know, it's a good football team. We're on the road in a tough environment. It's going to be a 48 minute ball game. So go ahead and strap them on and get ready. And, um, you know, I, I just tell our offense that we expect to score. So when Fleming was scoring, I mean, I'm confident in our offense, and I'm sitting there telling those guys, look, it's a shootout. That's what we're built for. We're going to score points. And um, even if, you know, you're a little worried on the inside, you gotta you got to make sure that your kids don't ever see that and, you know, stay confident. You mentioned taking the timeout and maybe yelling at him, ripping into him a little bit. Do you have to uh, change your, your personality, your coaching style, with a new group of players every couple of years? Or how do you go about coaching players, and, and how do they respond maybe when you call them out or when you're, you're a little tough on them? I think we have a really tough group this year. I think we've we've kind of built that over the last couple of years. Um, one of the things that we really harp on our kids about is having grit. And we, uh, we talk about grit for us. It's guts, resilience, intensity, and toughness. So that's one of our core values that we hang our hats on. Um, and I think it's it's starting to show, you know, in the past, um, you know, the past couple of years, nothing, and nothing against those teams because we've had some, some really good teams and some great kids. But, you know, I don't know if last year's team or the year before that, if they, you know, if they win that game Friday night uh, against Fleming or, you know, stay in the game and, and fight back against Raceland. You know, this team, uh, to me, in terms of just mental toughness, not necessarily physical, but just mental toughness, this team will not quit. Like they're going to play until the whistle goes off every Friday night, and I think that's something that our coaching staff has instilled in those guys, um, and, and not me in particular. Our assistant coaches, you know, Coach Moore does a great job. Uh, Coach Travis Jones does our receivers and DBs, and I mean, he's a high energy guy that that loves to coach. And uh, Coach Kennedy, our offensive line coach, and we got a new coach by the name of Scott Pollock from KCU. He was KCU's defensive line coach, and he's with us now, and he's another just high-energy guy that, you know, really pushes our guys to play hard. So I think it's just – it's a culture you have to develop, and it takes time. Uh, now, I will say this. My first year, the first team we had was incredibly tough. The team in 2016, they were just a bunch of tough kids. Like, physically, mentally, I think they – you know, they played a lot as freshmen, so they, you know, taken some some beatings, right. um, and obviously were a part of that. You know, that difficult time in Greenup County football where they weren't, you know, having a lot of success. But 
man, that first group of seniors I had, Cade Warnick and Jake Wright, Peyton Elster, Jarrell Jackson, those guys were just – they were an awesome group to coach, man. They were so much fun, and they were they were tough as nails. So, to me, uh, out of the four – you know, the four years, that first year's team and this year's team probably have the most resilience. Um, and, and that's a good sign. I mean, that's a sign, you know, that's what you want, and your coaching staff's doing a good job. I think one major improvement with this team so far this season has been the defense, uh, especially slowing down and stopping the run, and I know that's something that you guys worked a whole lot on over the summer, uh, just emphasizing run defense, and it looked like this past Friday, just to name a few players who stood out to me, Brady Clevenger, Tanner Root, and Cole French really getting after it, so big for you guys from their linebacker spots, and then I really love Zane Carter and Spencer Tackett's effort as well. You know, Zane with the big interception and Spencer recovering a fumble, and he had several uh, huge tackles throughout the game as well. I, I really think the defense looks uh, much improved in terms of stopping the run and, and maybe better than last year's group. Yeah, I can't say enough about our defensive effort. Uh, you know, first week against Raceland, a team that, you know, really likes to run the football downhill and is, is always big and physical up front. And I thought our defense stood up to the test. And you know, I think Raceland had less than 50 yards uh, total rushing that night. So that was a huge confident boost. And then, you know, uh, Friday night against Fleming, I, I know they had in the stat line they had over 100 yards rushing, but most of it was their quarterback on scrambles. Yep. Um, in terms of like a a true run, you know, a designed run play, I would be shocked if they had over 30 yards on those because I know in the second half of the Fleming game they completely abandoned the run. Like he was not going to hand the ball off. It was bubble screens or sprint out with their quarterback. And that's a testament to our defense. You know, those guys are are 100% bought in on stopping the run. And, uh, man, Coach Moore is on their, you know, butt every day. You know, about, look, we'll give up 500 passing yards before we give up 100 rushing yards. Like, we are going to make a a conscious effort to stop the run every Friday night. And, once again, it goes back to, you know, coaching and having great assistant coaches and those guys putting in the work. And, you know, I think that's a really good strategy to have, especially in our area, because a lot of the teams uh, try to establish the run game. They're just so run-centric. Uh, you'll see a team every now and then who has a quarterback who can really beat you through the air. But for the most part, a lot of teams in our area and, and in eastern Kentucky even like to establish that running game. So I think focusing your defense to stop the run and to slow down the run has to be a huge emphasis for you, especially in this area coaching against the teams that you coach against. Absolutely. You know, I think if you look at uh, our schedule in terms of teams that can really hurt you throwing the football, obviously Raceland, um, you know, they have two really dynamic receivers and, and Jake Hyten's a great quarterback. Um, so Raceland's a team that can hurt you throwing it. Um, you know, I'm sure Willersburg, obviously I'm not incredibly familiar with their style of play. I'm, I'm sure I will be here in a couple of <laughs> weeks, but, uh, you know, I know they have a, a very versatile offense, so I, I know they throw the ball well. Um, and then, obviously, Ashland um, is going to do some things in the pass game. Um, and Russell, Coach Maynard at Russell is going to, you know, he's he's not going to drop back and throw it 50 times. I think he threw it twice last night. But he can definitely, you know, uh, do some things in the pass game to hurt you. But, you know, you look at East Carter, Montgomery County, Menford, um, teams like that, you know, it's going to be run right at you all night. And and Russell, too. I mean, Russell wants to run the ball. He ran it, what, I don't know how many times they ran it last night, a bunch. Yeah, yeah <laughs> a about bunch. every time. Yeah, so, you know, you, in this area, in high school football, you have to be able to stop the run, and you better be able to run the football when you're on offense. If you can do those two things, you got a chance to be successful. That's something we're going to talk about later in the show because I actually have a very strong opinion about your next opponent on the offensive philosophy, offensive system that they run, the the triple option. Uh, as you know, I'm sure so hard to keep up with, and we'll get into that a little later, but I wanted to give some of your players a little shout-out here on this episode because uh, they, they really showed out against the Panthers on Friday. And first up, it's one of your senior captains, Austin Evans. I mean, he catches the winning 22-yard touchdown on a wide-open route, which – Frankly, I'm still not so sure how he got that open. Uh, and then making the game-saving tackle inside the 10-yard line to reserve victory. Just what a game from him. Oh, he's just – he's an awesome kid, first and foremost. He's one of the hardest-working kids on our team. So, uh, it didn't surprise me that he stepped up in a big moment because he's put in just a ton of work in the weight room and on and off the field. Um, but, 
just, you know, a kid that is incredibly tough, first and foremost, um, incredibly detail oriented. Like he's, you know, he's going to run the best route he can run down to every step. Um, on defense, you know, he knows every one of our coverages. He's going to get everybody else lined up. So, you know, really just an opportunity for him to make plays. And it didn't surprise me at all that he made those plays. So that's a credit to him and his preparation. Um, you know, he's going to put time in, watch him film. He's going to know his scouting report. He's just – he's a true, you know, competitor. And um, you talk about a kid that's worked hard in the weight room and changed his body. I mean, he's probably put on 15 pounds since last year. Um, he's a 300 pound bench press, which is crazy, you know, for a high school safety and a receiver. I mean, he's, he's almost a 500 pound squat. I mean, he's, he's really worked hard in the weight room and it's paying off for him. How was he able coach to get so wide open on that last touchdown catch 22 yards out, less than a minute to play in the game. I'm, I'm still wondering that. So we ran, um, essentially, you know, we ran him on a corner route, um, to the back pylon of the end zone, and we ran Austin Clarkson, our outside receiver, on a slant underneath the corner. And really, you know, we didn't expect the safety to jump the slant. We expected yeah. the safety to <laughs> run with that on the corner out. But the the defensive corner, cornerback, and the safety both jumped Clarkson on the slant. Um, I don't know if it was a busted coverage or if, you know, they were keying on Clarkson or what, but, uh, yeah, Evans got behind him. And th- that's a play that that's a that's a bread and butter play. Like that's a play we rep, you know, every day in practice. So it wasn't anything that you know I didn't come up with some genius play call or anything <laughs> like that. You know, I'm talking to Coach Jones on the headset. He's he's my right hand man on offense, and you know it's like, hey man, let's run. You know, let's let's, let's run the deal. You know, it's, it's what we do. It's what we do every day, and something we felt confident in, and our kids felt confident in. So um, I think in those big situations like that. You know, that's what's best is don't try to over scheme or come up with something creative. Just run what you're confident in and what you know your kids are confident in. Absolutely. And, you know, it seemed like as the game progressed, uh, Bryce Burgess only seemed to get better. And I think that's a testament to all the work that he's put in in the weight room as well as your big offensive line. I know they've really worked hard over their careers in the weight room, and it's really paying off out on the field. Of course, props to Bryce, too, for always being a tough runner and not putting his head down when yards were tougher to come by early on in the game. Yeah, Bryce is doing a fantastic job stepping up for, uh, you know, we obviously we lost Quentin Farrow, who was a big part of our offense, and we had high hopes for him this season. You know, I, I really felt like Quentin had the opportunity to be maybe the breakout player in the area yeah. because a lot of people didn't know a lot of people didn't know about him, and that kid is special. Like he he does some stuff with the ball in his hands that nobody else on our team can do. Um, so it was it was really sad, you know, for him because he's worked hard and. I hate it for our team, but I really hate it for Quentin because he put himself in a position to, you know, to get a lot of carries this year and have a fantastic year. But um, I know he'll work hard and bounce back, and um, he's he's staying positive right now. So, you know, obviously we wish him the best. But Bryce stepping up, um, you know, it's another senior that's worked hard in the weight room that uh, was just waiting for his opportunity, and he's taking advantage of it. So we're we're excited for Bryce and. Um, you know, I know he's he's going to work hard every week to, to be the best guy he can be and uh, take advantage of this opportunity. So much hype around the program for you guys over the last couple of years. You know, your quarterback, Eli Sammons, a big kid who is committed to Marshall. I think people look at him as a pass-first guy, and, and that definitely might be true, but he's really developed as a runner this season. And I'm wondering, was that – by design and something you, you've worked on him with lately, or is that something he's had to adapt with some injuries and stuff early on in the season? I would say a little of both. I mean, we knew coming in to the season that he was going to have to carry the ball some, and that was strictly because, I mean, he, you know, he's the biggest, strongest guy on the field. I mean, he's 6'6", 215 pounds. So, you, you know, we felt like we had to take advantage of that. He's worked really hard to get his body prepared, um, you know, to take more punishment running the ball. And you know, I, I just felt like we would be crazy as a coaching staff to not put the ball in his hands more. Um, you know, he's ran it. He's been over 100 yards uh, both games. I think we had him at 104 Friday night again. So, um, 
you know, just really it's just a, the matter of putting the ball in your best guy's hands and letting him make plays. Coach, let's be honest here and, and think back to uh, a couple years ago, you're thinking about maybe taking the green up job. I'm sure you had knew of Eli and probably thought, man, this kid is, is the prototype guy I would want for my spread air rate offense. Uh, did that factor into your decision at all? And, and if not, maybe what did? Um, I wouldn't say it played a major factor. I knew of Eli. I knew um, he was a very talented kid. I knew his dad a little bit. I knew Tony. I just knew of Tony. Um, but I knew they were, a, you know, a football family, and they were really committed to Greenwich County football. Um, but really with Eli, the first time that I realized he was special, that he could, you know, I'll just go, I'll just go on record. I've been saying he's a Division One quarterback since his freshman year, so I'm one. I'm one for one on my Division One quarterback. <laughs> but I mean, his freshman year, we were playing Russell in the JV game, and Coach Armstrong was calling the plays on offense at that time for JV, and we were just running like inside zone with a slant, and we weren't telling Eli anything to do. You know, we were letting him make the decision. And he was just ripping that slant through there like it was easy. I mean, he was throwing it on the money. He probably completed eight balls that, that game on that same play, and it was just perfect on the money every time. And he was getting it out of his hand so quick that the defense, you know, they couldn't hardly react to it. And when I seen him do that, I was like, he's ready. Like, he's ready for Friday nights. And, um, you know, we split time with him and Chase Hunt that year, and Chase – Chase is an awesome kid. Um, he's going to be incredibly successful at whatever he chooses to do. But um, Chase was a really smart kid, but he just, for our offense, for our style of play, he couldn't get the ball out of his hand quick enough. Um, and, and that was a challenge for him. And I think, if, you know, if we would have had Chase for a few more years prior to that, he would have been just fine. But, you know, he was it was late in his career. Right. Um he was a traditional under center, belly, wishbone right. quarterback. And um, it was nothing against the kid at all, but Eli just had a gift. And obviously, you know, that's, that's played out well for him. Um, <laughs> but just, man, you talk about a special kid as a freshman. I've never seen a quarterback, you know, get the ball out of his hand that quick. It was, it was fun to watch. With Eli in your offense, I know you guys always look over to the sideline to get a play call in uh, to take a look at the defense and, and then call a play in. Do you have in your offense uh, for Eli or for your quarterbacks an opportunity to where they can call an audible, or is your offense more catered to, to making the reads after the snap? So we don't we don't typically change the play at the line because what we try to do – so with – like our standard run play, say it's inside zone, um, we're going to have a run scheme. We're going to have a screen attached to it. So like a bubble screen or a fast screen is always attached. Gotcha. And then we're also going to have one receiver that has a route. So we have a run play, a screen, and like a slant or an out or a hitch, some type of route with our single receiver. Um, so really every play is almost – it's it's option football. It's triple. It's right. a triple option in the sense of you know a give or a pitch. It's you can hand it off, you can throw the screen, or you can throw the pass. So there's really no need to audible. He just I just leave it up to him, and he makes the decision pre snap or post snap. And you know there there are times where we have a system to where um, we'll check and he'll look at me and I'll tell him what I want him to do on certain downs. So if it's like a big third down play. Um, Sometimes I'll leave it up to him, but sometimes I want to make that decision for him. Um, but a lot of times, I mean, you know, he's the quarterback. He, he's got a better view than I do, so I just let him do it. You mentioned the offense you run, and I, I kind of compare it to a modern-day triple option, you know, just based out of a spread formation, though. And the team that you're playing this week, Montgomery County, here's the segment you guys were all waiting for. Uh, they run an old-school kind of triple option, and I'm going to be honest, when talking about the Indians, I just I hate – I absolutely despise teams that run the triple option. Nothing against them, of course, but just from my perspective as a cameraman on the field, I guess wrong every time. And then it's even tricky for me up in the booth as an announcer calling the game. Just 
how do you prepare to play those teams? And more importantly, why do you even schedule them? I, I know you've probably got to lose sleep uh, just thinking of how to stop that offense. Oh gosh, yeah. When I mean, <laughs> when teams can when teams can perfect that offense and run it, it's beautiful. I I absolutely love and you know I'm a air raid, I don't, air raid guy or whatever spread offense, whatever <laughs> you want to call it. Um, that's that's you know what I enjoy coaching, but I absolutely love watching. Paul Johnson, when he was at Georgia Tech. It's so weird now watching them at Georgia Tech not run the triple option. It's not right. It's not <laughs> right. They got to change it. You know, they got to go back. I don't care, you know, who they got to hire, but they got to they gotta go back. <laughs> but I I'll, I'll just absolutely love watching that offense when it's run smooth. It's, it's a thing of beauty. And, like, when I would play uh, NCAA football, you yeah. know, on, on Xbox or whatever. Those teams were the hardest to beat. Tech. <laughs> yeah, so like I'm a I'm a triple option guy at heart. I just don't have the I don't have the courage, I guess, to <laughs> to actually run it on a Friday night. But no, it's it's a thing of beauty, and you know Montgomery County does a great job, and um, their head coach is you know I think he's really putting their program um, on the upswing. You know they got over a hundred kids on their roster. Wow, it's it, have you seen what they do in pregame? I actually got to saw them a little bit in the scrimmage at Raceland a couple weeks ago, and, and it was really crazy. It's, it's honestly, their pregame warm-ups are a sight to behold uh, when Mount Montgomery County comes to town. It's like a practice. It's a, like a full practice in pregame. They got the tackling wheel, the dummies. I mean, it's it's wild, to say the least. But, um, you know, it's, it's fun to watch those guys, and it gets his team prepared to play, but – yeah, I, I highly encourage everybody this Friday night, get to the game a little bit early and watch Montgomery County go through their pregame because it is intense. Well, Coach, it's been exciting. Our first ever episode of Friday Night Mike. I know I'm personally looking forward to Friday night, uh, this coming Friday night for you guys. Home opener against Montgomery County, and hopefully the Musketeers are able to make it win number two on the season. Yeah, man, I'm, you know, I'm definitely excited. And uh, like you said, we'll make this a weekly thing. And uh, really just, you know, I don't want it to be all about, um, you know, me. It's not about me at all as a coach. It's, you know, about the program. It's about the kids. Um, it's about talking football, you know, me and you just talking area football and stuff like that. And, you know, so I, that's one of the biggest things I want people to listen to it to, to know here in our first episode is just, you know, it's, it's not going to be all about Greenup County football. Um, it's going to be, be about, you know, the behind the scenes stuff, uh, you know, that a coach goes through during the season, it's going to be about area football. We'll talk other players, other teams, um, and things like that. And obviously, um, you know, just, just two area football fans, man, talking ball and hashing it out. So I, I'm really excited for it. And, um, I think it's going to be a fun deal. Well, we hope those of you that did tune into the first episode here at Friday Night Mike enjoy the show. We hope you'll continue to listen to the show and make sure you share and support it. Uh, send out the link. Uh, make sure you leave us some feedback, too, and if you have any comments. Uh, unless, if, if, they're, if they're positive, that is. We don't want to hear any of the negativity. Isn't that right, Coach? That's right. And, <laughs> yeah, man, share it on social media, and, um, you know, we, we, we'll take any feedback, obviously. You know, the, you know, people let us know what they want to hear and what they'd like to maybe hear my you know insight about uh and and things like that and we'll we'll try to do our best job of you know talking like i said some of the behind the scenes stuff that, yeah. that maybe the typical parent or the typical fan don't see you know and obviously we uh we can't go into super detail sometimes with some situations because it is high school football but right We'll, we'll do the best we can to give some people maybe an inside look at the uh, 2019 season. That's all we've got for our first episode of Friday Night Mike. For my co-host, Coach Scott Grizzle of the Greenham County Musketeers, I am Ben Spicer. We'll see you back next week for another episode of Friday Night Mike.